keep keep and her to to the prayer list as well. If you open your Bible to Mark chapter twelve, we'll pick up where Daniel left off. I'll say that again, so it will be at the first of our of our tape when Ashley has us charged up and ready to go. Okay. So we turn to Mark chapter 12. We're going to pick up about verse 13, uh, where Daniel left off a couple, right in that area. We'll go back, and as we usually do, and pick up a few other verses and move uh, forward again. Uh, Daniel called this uh, the, uh, the, the, the far away or the far country. And he, he pulled into this uh, parable, uh, as recorded by Mark, he also pulled in the one recorded by Matthew in Matthew 21 and by Luke in Luke 19. And interestingly, he drew a parallel to uh, the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. And I thought that that was really interesting. I never thought about that before. But, you know, as he brought out, all of these are pointing towards the same direction, and that is we're in Jesus' last days in Jerusalem, the last days of his earthly ministry and the last days of his fleshly existence. And uh, that uh, all of these things that Jesus is saying in these parables is all pointing to something that is going to be taking place in the not-too-distant future for these people. And as he points to, in, in one place, it's... Uh, it's the representation of Jesus in Luke, it's represented as a nobleman. I think in Mark here, he's represented uh, as a certain man, and I think in Matthew, he was a certain man too, uh, going in, going a distance, going to a, a far country. Uh, um, one of them is mentioned, uh, I think, as just going, going a long distance. But the point being is that uh, in the representation there of Jesus, is this is Jesus who is going to be uh, leaving in the... Uh, in the Mark account where we are right now, the difference between the recorded in Matthew and that one in Mark, or excuse me, in Luke, is because uh, whereas the representation of Jesus in, in Mark, the, uh, the one who owns the vineyard, do you remember, who is different? It's who? It's God, right? God. God owns the vineyard, and the vineyard uh, is, is Israel. And uh, Daniel uh, very beautifully connected this to the uh, Isaiah passage, Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, where we have the Old Testament rendition of, of this is where Jesus has, has, is, is applying this uh, uh, from what was spoken by uh, Isaiah, the Messianic prophet. Uh, Isaiah is the most quoted uh, prophet uh, in the Old Testament because so much of what he has to say is those things that pertain to Jesus. But uh, Daniel did a, a beautiful job of linking this again to the, the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25 and uh, then uh, to the Mark 13 uh, text of uh, a son of man uh, going uh, f- to a far country and then uh, the Luke, uh, a nobleman. Uh, and the whole idea being is that there was uh, a going away, but there was also what? There was a coming back, right? Is that in each one of these instances uh, where it's represented of Jesus, that Jesus was going away and then he was coming back. And Daniel, again, linked that to John chapter 14, verse 1. You know, um, if, I, if I go, I go to prepare a place for you, and where I go, uh, there you will also uh, be. Uh, and that one is represented as mansions in one of these uh, uh, that... Uh, Jesus is going away to receive a kingdom. And so we can see all of this if we have the understanding, which I know we all do is the greater understanding of, that uh, the the destruction of Jerusalem, we're now in the, we're not just in the last days, but we're in the these last days. Uh, That uh, what Jesus is saying here is all reflective of him leaving this earth, that he will ascend into heaven where he will do what? Yeah, Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. Sit thou in my right hand until what? Till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And so the enemies, we're, we're, in, the, we're in the earshot of the enemies right here in these texts. Uh, 
that the enemies are in, in our Mark 12 passage, they're identified in verse 27 of uh, Mark chapter 11 as the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Um, Ezekiel represented them as the shepherds of Israel. And what did he say about the shepherds of Israel? Woe unto the shepherds of Israel. Why? Because they weren't shepherding. They had uh, ingratiated themselves with all the benefits and the goodies that come along with the authority, plus the fact that they were doing things on the side that were, you know, devouring widows' houses as one uh, as one of the uh, rebukes that Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 23, that they were you know, taking advantage of their position and their authority in, in the text... Uh, I think it's in the Mark 13 text, is speaking of these religious leaders that they, they like walking around in flowing robes. And the robes would be representative of what? Something that distinguishes them from somebody else. I mean, we, all, we have the same thing in denominationalism today, where people in, in certain denominations, the, the preachers, the pastors, or whatever they want to call them, they, they, wear, they wear garments that distinguish them from, from, from other people. And that uh, these religious leaders were doing that. They loved the salutations in the marketplace, which, you know, that would be, you know, the, the obeisance, I guess you might say, of, 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 of the people. And that they, they loved uh, the, the best seats uh, in, in the, uh, I guess it would be the synagogue or the Sanhedrin. And they loved the best uh, positions at the feasts. Uh, at, at the feast, that would be a celebratory feast that they would have... The, they didn't sit in chairs like we would, but they would sit on, lay, recline on, on couches, and the, the closer that they could get to the, to the, the host, uh, they took that as, as you know, uh, again, uh, position, place uh, above everybody else. So, in in this, in the in the rendition of Mark of this parable, going away uh, to. Uh, uh, he says, a certain man planted a vineyard and a hedge about it, digged a place, and one fed, built a tower, and went to a far country. And so the point being is that as, as we have this a parable of a vineyard, and then he leases it out, as we would call, our, what our familiar would be with like sharecroppers, and then at a particular time when the har- harvest was, was ready, that there, a, a portion of the crop, uh, belongs to the workers, but then another portion belongs to the person that owns the vineyard. And so he sends his servants back to collect his due and that they, they treat the, the servants mercilessly, end up killing, and then uh, the, the vineyard owner says, I'll send my son. They will revere my son. We have to be careful, you know, when we look at parables and it's not to, to be, be cautious about making them too literal because we would have a hard time understanding that if in, in reality, if someone had done that and they beat up all the servants and killed some of the servants, the last thing they'd end up doing is sending the son, probably sending an army. Um, so again, Jesus is, is, is making a lesson here, telling a parallel that is going to be to what is, is going to be taking place in, in the near future. Jesus will leave this earthly existence. He will return to a spiritual existence. And I think it's important for us to understand that when he leaves the earthly existence, is he coming back to an earthly existence? No, no, he's not coming back in the flesh. That when the, when the apostles see him ascend into heaven uh, on the cloud, uh, that's the last that they're going to see him in a in a fleshly way. Um, and so, uh, in the parable that he's that the, the vineyard owner is going to send his son, they will revere the son, but they end up doing what to the son? Yeah, killing him. Uh, in in uh, verse 7, it says, Let us kill him, and the inheritance will, will be ours. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 38, you have the, the basically the same thing. You know, it's, we will not do what? We're not going to serve this man. And uh, in the parable of uh, the marriage feast in Matthew chapter 22, you have the, basically the same thing. A king prepares a marriage feast for a son. You remember, you remember from our study in Matthew chapter 22, and sends out the invitations, and people will not come. Well, all of this is a picture of uh, Israel's rejection of Christ. And at the end of the conclusion of that lesson, the marriage feast is the king calls us. We're going to we're going to do what? We're going to destroy all of these people that uh, that would not come. And again, that's obviously a picture of of uh, of 
God's representation of his destruction of Israel. As a matter of fact, I, I, I thought about that uh, uh, the other day when we were, we were studying this. Uh, as Jesus quotes uh, David in verse 10, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Uh, that, uh, that, that, I think, passage is so important that Peter repeats it on the day of Pentecost. And then Paul uh, repeats it again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, the whole idea being is that it, God is going to have the say-so. God's going to have the final say-so in this. And uh, the sit thou at my right hand, which is the first part of this quotation, sit thou at my right hand until, when we have that word until, it means that there is something yet to take place. And until I make thine enemies thy footstool. We have to have a picture in our mind's eye. We've seen the medieval movies where the king sits on a throne and, and then he rests his feet on that, on that footstool. Um, that, that God is going to be the final say in the destruction of these as enemies. People point to 1 Corinthians 15 and say, well, see there, you know, Jesus still has enemies, for us, so therefore it can't be a fulfillment. The, no, the, the enemies are not the Romans. The enemies are not 21st century you and I beings. The enemies of Jesus were the people who should not have been the enemies. The Romans were the natural enemies. The real enemies of Jesus were those those vineyard servants, the, the Jews, Israel, because God had blessed them, had given them this provision, had blessed them, had preserved them, uh, his providential care over them, and they still end up rejecting. Those are the enemies of Christ, and those are the enemies then that are going to be made uh, the footstool. So that verse, uh, verse 11, uh, this was the Lord's doing. And verse 12, uh, this is about where Daniel left off. They sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people. They sought to lay hold on him. That's more, in my mind, that's more than just thinking about it. We don't have the whole story. Again, we get abbreviation. But they must have considered amongst themselves what they could do. But what? where are they? They're in the temple grounds. You get that from verse 35, that they're on the temple grounds. Well, they're not the only ones on the temple grounds. We have, this is the Passover. The population of Jerusalem is double what it normally is. And there's a press of all these people, and these people are seeing and they're hearing the things that Jesus is saying. And so that these religious leaders, these chief priests, these elders, these scribes, these Pharisees, they, they, they have to, it says that they left him and they went their way. Uh, but they, they didn't put it aside. So this is where we pick up at verse 13. And they, that would be the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, sent send unto him certain of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. These people are really, really devious. We see from the parable, they're, they're mean, they're vicious in what their intents and their purposes are. Um, they did that to the, to the prophets, right? Uh, in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus said, you know, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that what? Stone us the prophets and kill in them that were sent unto thee. And they, that there were still more that, that are, are going to, to die to be killed. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, namely Stephen. Did you have a comment, Del? The Jewish leaders also have to consider what, if they did that to Jesus, the uproar that it would cause, and that's one thing the Romans would not tolerate was terminal labels, simply. Right. So they had to consider what mm-hmm. what, what the penalty would be for the Romans if they caused an uproar. Yeah, you know, you're actually right there when you talk about certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians. The Herodians were Jews that were loyal to the Herod family. And the Herod family were kings as appointed by who? The Romans. The Herod families were not full-blooded Jews. They were half-blood. They were Idumeans. And so if with their loyalty to the Romans... Let's, let's say the Pharisees and the Herodians are not friends. But what happens when you, when you have a common enemy? <laughs> yeah, right, right. You, you pal up to each other. So it, it, it appears that the Pharisees went out and got the Herodians to, hey, you come and be a part of this because we're all at risk. Um, and so, you know, and you see that because that the idea to catch him, uh, we would say today, entrapment. I think that's an illegal term, isn't it? That... that uh, 
that you you can if you if you present something in court if it can be proven that you led somebody into a trap that's called entrapment and I guess that makes it dubious as whether or not that can even be a, a part of testimony but the, but they do this to try to trap him to to improve their chances to do what yeah they want to arrest him and so they they go into this silliness here that is is nothing but uh it's it's put forward in, 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 as as a, as an earnest question, but it's not really because Jesus recognizes Jesus knows everything. He knows the thoughts, the intents of the heart, and he recognizes the hypocrisy. But look what they say. And when they were come, that is, they come and find Jesus. They say to him, Master. Uh, the, the the idea of the word Master uh, is kind of like Rabbi and Teacher, you know. Uh huh. Yeah, uh, in, in, in this case, this is just pure flattery. Master, we know that thou art true. And the language here, and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God. Well, uh, again, Jesus uh, recognizes their hypocrisy in the next verse. So let's take apart this phrase, these words that they're saying. When, when, when they say you carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, you, you have an idea what he's talking about here? Or what they're what what they're saying about Jesus? They're afraid of the boldness of Jesus. They're afraid. Uh, they think that because he is so bold and he really doesn't care what anybody thinks about what it is that he said, that that's how they're going to be able to trap him. That's how they're going to be able to get him to say something to, to uh, relative to this this question that they're going to pose for him, which is: Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar? or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? Why is this an entrapment? Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. If it, yeah. It, it, they think that Jesus can only answer this. It's posed in a situation that's going to be yes or no. Right? If, if, if they ask Jesus, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? It, you're right. If he says no... Then the Herodians can see to the Romans doing what to Jesus? Arresting him. Because he's, yeah, he's speaking, speaking against the, the, local, the, the authorities, the government. If he, says, if he says yes, then the people that are surrounding, they're going to think Jesus is cowtailing to, the, to, the, to, the, to these people. Well, this, you know, render under Caesar, this, in, the, in this day and time, this is uh, Augustus Tiberius. Uh, we meet him in Luke chapter, is it Luke chapter 2, where he calls for a, a head tax. Everybody has to go to their home, uh, their, their home of birth. And that's how they take the census on who the people are, and they pay that, they pay that particular tax. Well, that's, that appears to be what this particular tax is. And so it's, 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 a, it's a tax that is imposed by Caesar himself. And so it, 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 it's a, of, of such that every man, every Jew, is obligated to pay it. And it's probably paid right here at Passover at, at the temple, at the temple location. And, and so Jesus doesn't answer this with yes or no. No, he doesn't give a question. He put a question back out there for them. Yeah. Yeah, right. He says, anybody got a coin? <laughs> And, you know, I mean, we put presidents and famous people in any country that I've ever been to, they all do the same thing. They, they put uh, a, a, the image of, of, of somebody that's important to that particular state or nation on there, and then typically there's a superscription, uh, e pluribus unum, in God we trust. Isn't that what, is that what that is? Or is that different? No, e pluribus unum is one out of out of many one people or something like that. I can't read this. I can't read this. Could, yeah, in God we trust. Yeah. Uh, so there's a superscription, and so that's what Jesus says. Says whose image is it? You know, and they say, well, it's Caesar's. And so Jesus' response is to what? Yeah, it's basically saying, who, wh- what country do you live in? <laughs> yeah, who is it that? protects you? Who is it that defends you from, from national or other enemies? You have a responsibility. Did God ordain civil government? Yes. 
think Romans 13. Absolutely he did. And one of the things that he tells Christians to do is what? Pay your due. Right? Why? Because it's God's way of having a civil order of society. Right? I mean, we can go into the other things that, that it says there. Well, you understand that. Standing army, police force, those, those things that, that are... And so Jesus is saying, you have an obligation here. You live in this country. This tax is imposed because it is for the benefit of every, 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 everybody. And so render under Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. And then what? Yeah, is that a for these people? <laughs> sure, because that's the difficulty that they're having. Is you know, as as he proved it by the uh, parable of, of the of the vineyard, uh, not being uh, responsible in in their obligations to having been sharecroppers, that for not having paid paid back to the Lord for. God's provision. And of course, what God wanted was what? Faithfulness. Faithfulness to the religion that God had, had given given them. A, a religion that would have kept them uh, an orderly, civil society. Because remember, at Sinai, God ordained not just religious law, but he also gave what? Civil law. Gave medicinal law. Gave them things that they would need to keep their lives uh, orderly. If anybody else has an has a observation or comment, please be sure and, and and say it. I think our microphone is picking up the audience fairly, fairly well, because I, I listened to uh, Sunday nights and I, I was able to make a distinction uh, on everybody that did comment. So please do. Did the, did the, uh, did the Bible speak of anything that, uh, about uh, what is it? Corporal punishment? Yeah. Corporal punishment. Yeah. Did the Bible speak of anything Do you, do you remember what that passage was? When we studied the law, we went we went through it through yeah, we went we went all the way through the law and God did ordain capital punishment. And I don't remember the text right offhand. Does anybody remember that we it, it's in Leviticus? I'll I will have it marked if you can get me close enough to the chapter, I bet I can I bet I can find it. But yes, uh, God did ordain uh, capital punishment. Yeah, I think that, that that's certainly within the context. Well, Zell, if you don't mind, we'll come back to that. I don't, I don't see it. Oh, here it is. It uh, begins in verse uh, 17 of Leviticus chapter 24. This is, this is who just quoted this? Was that you that just quoted, quoted this? Uh, Lonnie just quoted this, uh, verse 15. Verse 17, and he that killeth any man will shall surely be put to death. Uh, this is in the this is in the order of civil law. And he that killeth a beast shall make it good, beast for beast. We understand uh, that. Uh, and uh, if a man cause the blemish of his neighbor as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, for eye for eye, tooth for tooth, uh, so shall it be done to him. And he that killeth a beast, da 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 da. da. I was thinking that there was more in here. I believe I believe there's 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 more. There are more texts in it, but we get we get the point. You know, is that that's a part of uh, Leviticus 24. That, that verse begins at verse 17. The, the I'll just do this before briefly get back to, to back to our lesson. But the eye the eye for, eye for an eye, for tooth for a tooth, is not the retaliation. It's what? It's limitation, right? It's it's limitation on on retribution, on vengeance. You know, if if somebody knocks hurt your eye, whatever it is can't be any more than, than, than that, right? Uh, the, so it, the, the, the law deals with the limits of, of retribution, the lim, limits. Uh, you know, just like you'd go to court, if somebody has damaged you, uh, we, don't, we don't look at it in the same way, but it's, it's the same thing. Whatever, whatever the penalty is, it has to be a proportion of whatever the offense was. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. It was in that civil civil law context of of the, of the old law. All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. But then carrying over to now in application, basically we 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 are to obey the laws of the land. You you understand what I'm going with that? This was given to the people. You know, and of course, in theory, we do have our laws do. Mm-hmm. Line up to, you know, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, just just a brief look at Romans 13 because I want to answer Zelda's question so that you have a place to look this up. In, in Romans chapter 13, Zelda, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. That means what? Human authorities. We have we have a higher power because of of the, the constitutional type government that that we that we are under. Uh, there's no power uh, but of God. That uh, that means that God has ordained civil authorities, uh, civil government to 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 con- to monitor the conduct of people and to have laws in place that that. Uh, that people are, are civilized. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. So to be disobedient to civil law is the same as being what? Disobedient God to God. Why? Because God ordains civil law. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Well, that's an, that's an idealism, Right? That if we, if we're obedient to the laws, then we'll have the praise of. Uh, for he is the minister, he the civil authority is the minister of God. Means that civil authorities are the ministers of God, because the ministers of God are to do what? Well, he says it right here. But if if you do what's evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath on him that doeth evil. So we have that that God here has ordained civil government to do what? Punish evildoers and reward those that that are 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 obedient to the law. Uh, and and look at verse six. For this cause pay ye tribute also. Okay. For they that is civil government are God's ministers attending continually on everything. I was looking for the uh, for the verbiage there. In verse four, uh, the civil government is the minister, the servant of God, to do good. But if thou wilt do which is evil, be afraid, for he civil government. That's a, that's a personal pronoun, but it's talking. We're talking about the the antecedent of that pronoun is civil government. Beareth not the sword in vain. In other words, that God has ordained civil government, and civil government is to make sure that people that that. Good people are protected, and bad people are punished, and not bear the sword in vain. That's um, an expression that means what? What's the sword used for? Yeah, right. So there, there, and again, you know, you have, uh, you know, in terms of of military, we have standing military to do what? To protect the people. That's a responsibility of civil civil government. All right. Let's go back to our lesson. If anybody has anything to add to that, verse sixteen, and they brought. They brought it, and they brought it. They brought the coin to him. Whose is this image? Is superscription? We already covered this. Caesar and Jesus said, "Render Caesar the things that are Caesar to God, the God things." That are God. And they marvelled at him. That's a very interesting place to leave off here. <laughs> Remember in Matthew seven twenty eight, the end of the the Sermon on the Mount. It says the people were what astonished at his doctrine, not because of the miracles, not because of the healing, not because of the lame man get up and walk. But they were astonished at what? The things that come out of Jesus' mouth. The thing that astonished at his doctrine. And here, I think we can just basically say they're held speechless. Yeah. I mean, they, they expected a yes or no question that would get him in trouble. You know, we're gonna, we got him now. We're going to see to it that he's arrested. And it didn't work. All right, so the next next blast to come is then come to him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. This is where it really gets silly. The Sadducees don't even believe in a resurrection. They only believe in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They only believe in the law. That's Forget the prophets. They only believe in the law. And so, therefore, they're totally outside the limits of, of resurrection. And so they come here with, you know, they're, get, they're getting in on this. We have the Pharisees, we have the Rhodians, and now we have the Sadducees. All of these people are trying to do what? Get rid of this guy. Right, this guy uh, is as Daniel brought up the other. These this guy's undermining authority. This guy's going to get us in trouble. The Romans, and then what? We're going to lose our our power over the, over the people. Yeah, yeah. They right, right. The whole idea is to get him arrested. You know, Jesus is now within their reach. Why? Because this is Passover. He's come to Jerusalem for Passover. They don't have any. Sadly, they don't have any idea of what's taking place this week. Why? 
Why is it so sad? Particularly amongst the, the Pharisees. These, these are lawyers. Meaning what? They should know. These are lawyers. These are people who know the law. These are people that know the prophets. These are the people that should have been paying attention to the prophets and the words of the prophets. To show you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a principle by which we need... It's, I loved what Daniel said the other day, you know. We have this freedom in what we come to understand to what the Bible is saying. And in that freedom, we have the weight of, of all of the checklists that he went over. Remember that he went over the idea of the checklist that, you know, the five acts of worship, the plan of salvation, going to VBS, going to luncheons, going, you know, that, and tell your neighbors you're going to hell. See, I've got it all. We don't, we don't live under that, that, the burden of that, that checklist system. That we, we, we recognize that we're fallible. And we're recognizing that to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have to pass up where you were yesterday. Which means what? That we're probably going to see something different tomorrow than what we see today. But what if, what if something and we drop dead today? Well, it's like he said, that God has enough grace to cover our own ignorance. Yeah, isn't that the truth? And that's what he meant the other day. And I thought, that, that's just a brilliant way of saying that. Yes, sir? Here's one thing. Here's one thing. To know the word, but not put it in action. That's another thing. It's mm-hmm. out there. So many people cram and want to know the word. But mm-hmm. they're not doing anything mm-hmm. with what they know. Mm-hmm. They're trying to reach out to others mm-hmm. and help them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, anyway, these Sadducees, they're, they're going to they're post something that's just so, so absurd. But the whole idea is to, uh, again, is to make, they're, they're doing this at Jesus' expense. That, that the Pharisees, they do believe in a resurrection, but they believe in a physical resurrection. And that physical re- res- resurrection means that the, in the heavenly world that they're going to still be uh, measuring things as, as if they were human. Look at, the way, look, at the, look, look at the way they put it. Moses wrote unto us, If a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed, meaning heirs. Remember the, uh, Daniel's lesson on the name, right? How important it was. Ancestry was so important to the Jews and to have a name, uh, to have, uh, to have uh, some level of title, uh, to have some way to know the division of the land and what land was yours and, and things that belonged to you know, to the land. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying he left no seed. In other words, uh, the, the husband died, and the next brother married, and so there was still no descendant. And the second took her and died, and left an end, and the third likewise, and the seventh had her and had no seed. Last of all, the woman died also in the resurrection that they don't believe in. <laughs> In the resurrection that they don't believe in, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For seven had her to wife. And again, it, it, it's, such, it's, it's so theoretical that it's absurd. And, and, but they're doing it to embarrass Jesus. They're doing it to embarrass him in front of all these other people. How's he going to answer this? They do it. I, I, I think it's a jab at the Pharisees, too. Because, uh, you know, this old idea uh, of... of in the, in, the resur- in the resurrection that they don't believe in, whose wife will she be? Well, they're still seeing things in human terms. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus answers, said unto them, Do you not therefore err? I like the other, the other text. I think it's in our Matthew 21 text, or is it in Luke 19, where Jesus says, Don't you even know what the Scripture has to say? You know, you're the lawyers. Because you know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise... Uh, Jesus, obviously, when they shall, that means a future rest, a future event, right? For when they, they, the, the, they, the d- deceased, they, the, the, they who are to be resurrected shall rise from the dead. They, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. Now there's the first clue. That the heavenly existence is not what? It's not a physical world. It's a spiritual world. And so people today, will I know so-and-so in heaven? Well, you know, you're answering, asking a question that I don't think anybody can really definitively s- s- say. It, it's just such a wonderful world that Paul has said that, you know, that, that we can hardly even, even conceive of, of how wonderful it will be. Yeah, but you, <laughs> I know. You, we, you we, haven't, haven't thought about it the same way. Sure, I've thought about it. I bet everybody in this room has. My, that's my grandma and my grandma. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's got to be some way that, yes, we, we're going to know the patriarchs. We're going to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, I just don't know what form or how it's going to be. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so that's what he says here. As, as the angels. We know the angels are created beings. They're spiritual beings. They're not, they're not physical. They, they took on physical representations at time, you know, like the one that appeared to Gideon. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Since time began, uh-huh. I mean, it God not being a respecter of person. Listen, if I get up there, I love all y'all. <laughs> I hate that song in our songbook that says someday I'll understand. No, when you get there, you're not going to care. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, right. Well, sure. Yeah. Uh, the, there's just some things about the spiritual world that, you know, it, it's just not intended as for us at this point to know. But, but just to know it's grand. That's the point, is just to know that it's grand. <clears throat> All right, uh, shall be as the angels, and as touching the dead, they that rise, have they not read in the book of Moses? Um, back to their ideas here. Their second clue is, is you need to get back to the source of your information. How in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of what? Of the living. And the point being there is that these revered patriarchs uh, they they ex- are existent in God's world, and that 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 certainly God knows goes knows who they are. Uh, that uh, and uh, there's a, there's a cemetery up <laughs> up near Winter Haven that has Church of Christ Cemetery, and I thought I just don't like the sound of that <laughs> because. <laughs> Well, that was the original intent by the people who gave the land, but it's it's being sold now, and it's got a huge trust fund that's being fought over. But but anyway, you know, I, I look at that and I said, you know, we we just can be silly, totally silly. And I think of this particular passage. He's not the God of the dead, you know. If there if there is any faithful, if there remains of any faithful are there, guess what? The faithful are not there. <laughs> All right, so he's the God of the living. Why? Because he's the only living God. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them, uh, and I think it's, it's well to note here, uh, Jesus says, and uh, answered them well, answered them well, that uh, in other words, that, that uh, Jesus thought, highly of this man's, uh, what, what he had to, to say here, which is the first commandment of all. And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all of thy strength. This is the first commandment. And he doesn't stop there and he goes on then to the second. So he's just saying here is the one God, the one living God. And since he is the only one, whereas these people are surrounded by pagan nations and idolatrous nations and heathen nations who have the, the plurality or the the, the the, the multiples of God, he's, he's the one God. And so therefore, all of our what? All of our love, all of our adoration goes to this, this one God. There's no dividing up uh, in, 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 in the lead to the commandments. He's a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods for him. Why? Because he's a jealous God. God is not going to allow one to divide up his allegiance or, or his loyalty. And the second is like, is like, namely this: Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And so that's you know a direct uh, quote from Leviticus 19 and verse 18. There is none other commandment greater than these. Uh, in 
in uh, the Matthew uh, 22 account, it says that uh, all of the law and the prophets hang on these words. And I think we can under- understand that is to love God. If, if everybody loved God, as is laid out here, there wouldn't be what? There wouldn't be any disorderliness in civil society, right? right. People... Well, Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is another but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And this is what Jesus commends the man for saying. You know, that, that for 1,500 years, these people had been doing what? Slaying the Passover lamb, slaying all of these animals of sacrifice. And the whole idea of sacrifice was an atonement for what? Sin. But if you had this love for God, and likely and as a like weight for your neighbor, there wouldn't be any need even for sacrifice. When Jesus, that, when Jesus saw that he, uh, this man, had answered discreetly, that he had uh, answered without any, there wasn't any mischievous in this man uh, as there was in the Pharisees, the Herodians, and the Sadducees. This man was, was, you know, again, Jesus knows the heart of a person. He didn't identify this man with any hypocrisy as, as was with the, with the Pharisees and the Herodians. Uh, he says he answered him discreetly. Jesus said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Uh, not far from the kingdom of God. How, how, would, how would we understand that? Anybody have a... Yeah, this kingdom that Jesus has been saying is nigh at hand, is, is near, uh, that John preached, Jesus preached, you know, that... Uh, this, this man, that the kingdom is, when he can say he's not far from it, that this kingdom that is on the horizon, this man's statement is so powerful that he, it, it puts him to, to such an understanding as that this man would be included in the kingdom. Thou art not far from the kingdom. Now, Jesus means, means just, you know, in, what are we talking about, uh, 50 days, right? They're gonna, we're going to have the day of Pentecost. Uh, that this man, when the first gospel sermon is preached and people, 3,000 obey the gospel and come into the kingdom, that this man is already right at the verge of, of that because of these, these words came from a, a, a genuine heart. And no man after that durst ask him any question. Again, so he's, he's just, you have, you have him, he's surrounded by these religious leaders that are looking to entrap them, and Jesus keeps saying things that is totally unexpected, and so they... <laughs> well, until the next bout. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the next... the next. We only have four minutes, so I don't think we ought to go, go into this, but it, uh, you go ahead in your home study, and whether it be Daniel or myself picking up at, at verse 35, he's still on the temple grounds. You see that in the first sentence? So Jesus is saying, saying here, and uh, he's going to pose a question to these religious elites, and it's a question that it's not that they can't answer, it's that they won't answer. Anybody have any closing parting words or observations that might like to add here at the last minute? Oh. 